Good morning. This uh, welcome to Sociology 6315 online. Uh, qual research methods, qualitative methods, sociological practice research one. I'm Steve Blanchard, and I'm the uh, instructor for the course. I um, will be doing some videos over the course of the semester. This is the first time I've done videos for online classes, so. Uh, but I think uh, I think we'll make it work. I thought that um, doing videos. Uh, to supplement, complement, however you want to say, prof's notes and other sorts of uh, interaction that we'll have, like principally discussion, uh, would be of help to you and it, it's helpful to me just to kind of be doing this sort of thing, getting engaged in the course, I guess we'd say. Huh? Um, this course is the first of really two semesters. Uh, this is the qualitative methods. Uh, the 6316 the is quantitative methods. The overall combination of the two is called mixed methods. Uh, and the, one of the texts that we'll use mostly towards the end of the semester for the setup of your uh, qualitative uh, study is um, this book. You can see it. Um, mixed methods have become prominent in social sciences over the last few years. And um, I think here in, at the university, we've thought for quite a number of years that. Uh, while qualitative can stand alone, one can do a qualitative study and then um, let that be the, th be the study, and even publish it or whatever. Quantitative studies require qualitative study to enhance their validity. Unfortunately, most quantitative studies don't um, have a qualitative side term, or at least one that we see that's published, um, and probably they really don't. Uh, quantitative studies are often from secondary data uh, like the census data or data collected by somebody else, administrative data. And so the analysis has sprung off that without really taking the time to um, talk to the people uh, from which that data were drawn. For example, if we were to use the U.S. Census data uh, descriptors of the west side of San Antonio, uh, we could probably write some good papers, let's say. Uh, an interesting study about the cultural, social, cultural dynamics of the West Side. Um, but on the other hand, uh, maybe it wouldn't be quite so good uh, as it would be if we were to, prior to doing the quantitative study, we were to go into the West Side and do some qualitative research, some qualitative conversations, listen to the voice of the West Siders, focus groups, key informant interviews, and that sort of thing. Conversations, we can listen to the voice and test the validity of that data that was collected for the census, obviously for a whole different purpose than ours, uh, mostly for enumerating the population. Um, but to test the validity of that data um, in the census as a good descriptor of the West Side. So um, I think you'll find as we go through this course that it's a very reasonable um, approach to research. And um, anyway, I think you'll find it uh, an interesting thing to do. The qualitative side of this, which is this semester, uh, we will uh, do a qualitative study of some sort. Uh, it be one of your choice, and we'll talk about that as we get into the semester. And then um, it'll involve a developing a, um, a interview guide for focus groups and key informant interviews, uh, maybe a sample of anywhere from one to seven to eight or nine people. It's not important the breadth in qualitative as it is the depth. So in qualitative, we're more likely to interview a small number of people uh, at length um, in order to get to the depth of, of what the situation or the human uh, issue is or the um, social phenomena is. Whereas in quantitative it's about breadth and um, so qualitative is often about exploring in depth and quantitative is, is more about breadth and explanation. So the thing that we will do this fall in the qualitative project, towards the end of the semester we'll begin talking about how we can begin to think about recasting it in the spring as a quantitative study. And uh, so, for example, your interview guide that you develop questions for your uh, small qualitative sample will become sort of the seed for the elaboration into a survey instrument for the quantitative study. Now, on the qualitative side, you'll probably do some interviews, a handful of interviews here and there, something reasonable to do, I think, 
in the course, but on the quantitative side it'll be a proposal. Uh, and we'll talk about this later in the semester and certainly at the beginning of the spring. It'd be extraordinarily difficult for you to uh, conduct a quantitative survey that would involve uh, a thousand people perhaps, uh, at least three or four hundred, but we'll talk about probability sampling and all of that later in the semester, but uh, really in the first part of next semester. So that's kind of what we're going to do. Qualitative this semester, quantitative next. Qualitative is exploration. Quantitative is explanation. Qualitative is in depth. Quantitative is in breadth. And combined, they are mixed methods. Uh, one brings the voice to the issue of interest, and the other one brings the more quantitative um, aspect uh, to the issue in a way, and that's kind of a triangulation. We're not just focusing on one aspect uh, or looking at it from another aspect. We're trying to see it as a crystal and look at the quantitative facets and the qualitative facets and all of that. That uh, makes a much, uh, much more refined, um, uh, much better study, I think, and that's the uh, impetus now in social sciences. All right, let's talk for a minute about qualitative studies and what we're going to do, qualitative methods. We have a, a interesting situation, you and I, as social scientists. For one thing, and maybe for the thing, uh, the object of interest to us is invisible. If you think of love or friendship or family or success or things that, are, that resonate with us, you don't really see them. Uh, you see indicators of their presence, perhaps, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Unlike the physical scientist who has a frog in front of them for dissecting, they can see it, they can touch it, they can smell it, they can hear it, they can taste it, they can do uh, use their sensory apparatus to look at that physical object in front of them. Um, for us, the object, the social object, if we'll call it that, is not so easy to see. Um, the indicators of the presence of the frog are manifest in our um, sensory apparatus in a way that the indicators of the presence of a social ph phenomenon are not manifest. So we have to take an extra step or two in order to see, in italics shall we say, uh, the indicators of that presence. Um, and that's what this class is about. Um, the course, what the principal book is called Phenomenological Research Methods. We will consider, we can call a frog a phenomenon, no doubt, and you and me uh, a phenomenon. But um, here we're talking about uh, the objects of interest to us, those phenomenological objects, the phenomenological of a frog, interest of science, the phenomenological of love, of interest to uh, social scientists, let's say, or friendship. Um, so we're going to use the phen phenomenological research methods. How we can, in these methods, we'll see that there are ways that we can bring that, uh, the presence of that to the forefront. Not so much that we can see it, uh, perhaps in italics we can see it, but the indication of its presence. Uh, so you'll I'll have you look, you'll see on the syllabus, which I'll post up on the blackboard. This is Thursday, and I think the class begins on, in a couple of days on Saturday. Uh, the blackboard, we're using the old blackboard, by the way, uh, for this semester, but um, I've got the course uh, blackboard course framework set up. I have to post a couple of items today to get it really up and running and then send everybody an email in the morning and say it's up. Tomorrow morning being Friday. Uh, that'll be the um, Friday the uh, 23rd. Yeah. Okay. Um, in this, phenomenological research methods. We're going to do some practicing. We're going to do a number of uh, uh, research uh, practices. Uh, one of those is the method itself, um, the epoche and the phenomenological reduction and the imaginative variation. And um, that would be something like where we will, and we'll speak at length about this, and it's a critical piece. It sounds, when we're talking about it, a little on the absurd side, uh, but then we make a lot of assumptions as we navigate the social world, do we not? Uh, for one thing, we, we assume that it's there, and, and of course I suppose it is there, at least in terms of the consensus that we all agree that it's there. We'll talk more about that um, as the semester goes. 
But um, for example, if I, I'm in my office sitting on a stool and I look out the window in the mall down there and there are uh, a man and a woman standing there or sitting on a bench, I might imagine what they could be. They could be brother and sister, they could be new acquaintances, they could be close friends, they could be lovers, uh, they could be a number of things that they are. And because it's a man and a woman sitting together on a bench, I make the assumption that they're boyfriend and girlfriend or something. But I may be way off the mark. I don't see really that what they are is not visible to me. I can see their two selves, their two bodies there, but that phenomenon that exists between them, that they see and feel, I, I, I don't have any indication of what it is. So I would do the epoche and disabuse myself, remove myself from myself, any expectations of understanding and interpretations of what that is. And then I would reduce down and then I would open up my eyes and look and reduce and focus only for a moment on that, just only on that. Try and exclude everything else in the environment. Look at that. Re uh, do the phenomenological reduction. Reduce to that phenomenon and look at it as if it were for the first time. As though I'd never seen it before in my life. And then my imaginative, imaginative variation will then pull up out of me things that, I, that might be interpretive. In other words, what I'm doing here is not sort of preconceiving what is there, but I'm trying to clear my mind and soul so that I see it as if it were for the first time, and then allow, reduce to it, remove things from the environment that are influencing my interpretation of it, and then let, let my imagination, the indications of what that might be, uh, come forth. Uh, now, this is about this couple, but we would do the same thing if we were going to the west side. Don't go to the west side of San Antonio or the east side of Houston or wherever you might be with the assumptions that you know what that place is about. And you may live there and have some pretty good idea. But to the extent that you go already knowing, you've got, uh, you've got a grid on, you've got some interpretation, a framework for understanding it. We don't want that. In qualitative methods, we want to remove that and see what is in front of us if it's, if, as if it were for the first time. Give it voice. Not our voice, but um, its voice. Now I'm going on and on about this, but it's an important point and we'll talk more about it um, later. There are, are going to be some exercises, some practice exercises that you do, practice assignments. They're all phenomenological. Um, I can open this page up here. One of them is, you'll, we'll do that exercise we just talked about. Um, that's uh, practice assignment one. We'll do that in the first part of the, uh, first part of the course. And then we have something called ethnomethodology. And um, ethnomethodology is about um, breaching the assumptions uh, that we have in our, in our interaction. If you, for example, if you go to a mall, uh, you know, one of those enclosed malls, generally people are going to move to the right as they go around the mall. Maybe that's influenced by we are on the right hand side of the lane when we drive. If you go around to the left, if you go around to the right, you can kind of look at the windows as you go and you're pretty going with the flow. You don't have to worry about bumping into somebody. But if you go to the left, you're breaching the routine, shall we say. And while you look at the window, you better keep your right eye or your eye going this way because people coming this way are assuming no one's going at them. So, and who said we do it that way? There's no signs when you enter a mall that says, hang to the right. Um, there are some assumptions that we make walking down the hallway. There are numerous scores of these that we'll explore. We're going to do ethnomethodology to see what are those ethnic, uh, eth eth not ethnic in terms of um, race and ethnic, but what are those, like in ethnography, what are those ethnographic um, rules that, that appear, uh, perhaps culturally derived, um, that facilitate our navigation so we don't really have to think about it. You know, we just, we just move. Uh, through the phenomenon. Then we're going to do some observation, participant observation, where you sit at a table and observe the interaction and participate in it. Uh, Non-participant observation, where you'll be sort of uh, uh, at a distance and observing interaction and then trying to interpret what's going on. And then we'll do sociograms, which are kind of diagramming the flow and exchange of the energy and conversation between the participants. And then we'll do something called dramaturgy. And it's about um, in a way, it's about how all the world is a stage, as Shakespeare might say. It's how we, um, how we interact with one another, and how we, how in a way, not that we're playwrights 
and in a sense we are playwrights, especially if we're going to be setting up an interview. Uh, we think about what is going to be the context of the interview and um, what, are, what is the thing, what are we going to do in order to influence the rapport, to get a good connection with the respondent to our interview and all that. But even in, in life, um, there are things that we do, roles that we play. Some of them are like professor and student, some of them are friends, some of them are informal, some of them are formal. But that the dramaturgy is about exploring the dynamics of how we interact and how some of it is scripted and some of it is not and some of it is tightly scripted and some of it is, is sort of scripted on the fly and uh, we'll talk about uh, dramaturgy uh, oh, I guess it's probably somewhere in mid-October and then there'll be a practice project the practice project will be um, identifying one, two, four, five, however many uh, individuals that you want to do uh, an interview to do your qualitative project uh, some social phenomenon of interest to you, and we can talk about those um, as we get into the semester. Um, I think uh, you'll see from the syllabus that uh, there's class participation. I'll have that set up. I want uh, interaction on in the discussion, collegial kind of interaction, uh, postings every week, uh, substantive postings on the theme of ethnomethodology or qualitative methods and um, there's an expectation of that and you'll see that in the syllabus um, and then the four practice assignments in the practice project um, but I, I think the discussion the discussion to me is is very important uh, ordinarily if this were a different kind of environment we'd be sitting around a seminar table you me as graduate students and a graduate prof and engage one another for three hours straight and uh, take a break for a cup of coffee or something uh, but here we're strung out over a semester, over a week or two weeks on an assignment that we would sit for three hours in a seminar uh, once a week. We're now strung out over hours of a week in a linear discussion that uh, makes it uh, difficult to form the unity of the conversation. Uh, I want us to think of ourselves as a virtual uh, seminar. And, um, and come to the table, the virtual table during discussion, as though we were in a seminar, sitting around a seminar table in a classroom somewhere. So anyway, um, this is what the course will be ab about. Those of you who don't know who I am, I've been on the campus about 20 years. I've got a PhD from the University of Texas in Austin. I'm a sociologist, uh, actually a demographer by training, uh, graduated from the Population Research Center at UT in Austin. It was affiliated with sociology, so I got a sociology degree, and I'm glad I did because it's contextual perspective on health. I have a master's degree in public health, so the sociological perspective, contextual perspective on human behavior has, has turned out to be invaluable to me in terms of my pro bono work and community work and teaching. So uh, anyway, I look forward to working with you this semester, and uh, I'll uh, post another video in a week or so. Uh, and there'll be some materials that will be up on the website. By the time you look at this, uh, the website will be up and running and you'll see uh, what there is out there to do. So I look forward to working with you and uh, you take care.